could do whitewater boating. Surf in West Virginia, of course, West Virginia game. That's what it, their bumper stickers say. Surf in West Virginia is, I guess, uh, boating on the Gawley or the New, um, New River. Big, big white water. And uh, riding waves, I guess, is, not sure what that's gone to. Don't know. That's kind of boring. That's just advertisements. <laughs> ah, fine. So, um, well, well, that's one way to do it as well. Yeah. So gravity, friction, I guess, on rock, but also friction on um, the base of the water, which is, in our terminology, it's uh, viscosity that drives that. And so quite amazing what people do, I guess. I suppose you need to check that the plunge pool below the waterfalls are deep enough for you to peaten in and still come out. Yeah, amazing stuff. So, a couple of your colleagues, actually Garrett, your TA, the undergraduate TA from the class who was sitting here last time, he and his buddy and their friends went kayaking uh, this past weekend, rented some kayaks from Penn State. Penn State has a big rental program in the IM building, camping gear, hiking gear, climbing gear, sticky shoes and chalk bags, sleeping bags, uh, and also kayaks. Uh, maybe even have ice climbing gear, I'm not sure. So, at very reasonable prices. So if you didn't know that, then uh, uh, that's quite a decent resource for you. So, anyway, so we looked at some wave riders at offshore Portugal the other week and now this is in rivers same principle gravity pulling you down uh, if you're surfing the front of a wave gravity pulls you down and the wave flows underneath you and there's friction against you so gravity pulling you this way friction pulling you this way and there's so there's a stasis between those that allows you to stay on the the front of the wave something may be closer to when home circulated down the drill string and up the hole so um for anyone dealing with uh, the subsurface, petroleum engineers, mining engineers, environmental systems engineers, drilling holes for water wells and to drag gas out of the ground or to drag contaminated water out of the ground, drilling is an intrinsic part of that. And usually it occurs through a it always occurs through a drill hole. And usually you fill the drill hole with uh, drilling mud. Uh, and this drilling mud circulates down the inside of the the inside of the drill string, comes out of the bottom and recirculates up to the top. And its purpose is to flush cuttings from the bit, which get broken off. It's to cool the bit if the boot bit gets hot because it's uh, breaking up, providing energy to break rock at the bottom. Uh, but it's also to hold the, the well bore open by the pressure that it applies to the well bore. And so often in drilling, uh, they'll add a slurry of bentonite clay to it to take the density up from 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter to I don't know, 1,500 perhaps. I don't know if it goes that high. Uh, to provide more push against the walls, to be able to keep them open, to stop it sloughing in. And also to put a cake on the walls so that the water, the drilling fluid, just doesn't disappear into the formation and is useful within the, uh, the drill hole. And so... Uh, so that's one other utilization of pressures at a point, which of course depend on the pressure above us. Uh, not only drilling for oil wells, but if you have a geothermal heat pump in your house, or deep geothermal, uh, which is the baseload power desire, um, mainly in the west for hydrothermal, but the hope is that you could bring it out east where we're not on a plate boundary and it doesn't get hot very quickly, as quickly as it does on the West Coast. But for houses, you can have a heat pump in your house where, in this case, I think I was listening, they drill 300-foot wells. Our well at our house for water is 300-foot deep, same technology. And then within that well, they would put a U-tube. And the U-tube would circulate water down and then back up to the surface. And you'd use that tube to be able to get the temperature of the ground in the shallow subsurface. So groundwater around here is probably 55 centigrade. So I guess that's 10 degrees centigrade, 55 uh, Fahrenheit, uh, 10 degrees centigrade. And you use that as a heat source or sink for an air conditioner, heat pump. 
So you use it as a supplementary energy supply to, to be able to help your air conditioner work more effectively. And so this is just a hole in someone else's garden. A lot of mess, but they'll clean up from that certainly after that. And so I, I don't know if they they do show you putting, yeah, putting this tube. This is a two tubes. You see it's a U-tube that goes down, two, two components. And so I think, uh, I don't know, I guess they circulate water, or they might circulate glycol, which doesn't freeze um, in the subsurface. Because it's freezing where they are, right? Because it's snowing, uh, as you can see. So that, and I, I think this other one has subtitles to it. Uh, yeah, so I'll let this run with subtitles. A year younger than me. You can, you can read. So this was a, a first major failure of an arch dam. Happens in the, the south of France, um, near the city of Freyus, uh, near Nice, not so far away from Nice, on the Riviera, uh, Côte d'Azur, the Azur co coast. And so I suppose the dam was for water supply. It's a very arid area of, uh, of the south of France. Uh, Roman aqueduct from, the, from a couple of millennia ago. Malpasse, the name of the town. There's a dam that was there. Uh, and uh, they built a reservoir. And uh, the reservoir is a very uh, slick engineering construction, a very thin skin arch dam. The water would be on the upstream side of it up here, pushing down. It reacts against the abutments, and it's the structural rigidity of the dam um, which provides a reaction into the, the abutments, the rock abutments, and uh, holds the water back behind it. In the middle, I guess, it's got a spillway, which is this small depression. Uh, but what happened uh, just after its construction, after they were filling it, um, they filled it almost all the way up to that, the base of that spillway, that little cut in the dam. And the dam failed. So, and so that's, well, I guess we just went through that, right, in Ukraine. Um, mysteriously, a big dam on the Don River in Ukraine in Rus uh, at the boundary between uh, the Russian and Ukrainian occupied territory mysteriously failed at the beginning of the Ukraine offensive and just flooded all the region down, downstream. I think it was a pretty broad floodplain, so it just flooded it and messed it up in a big way. But in this case, it's a, an arch dam across a really very narrow uh, valley, a gorge, and so it's not very easy to get out from that. And so uh, the result was that there was, in 1959, there was a, uh, a new hazard observed from dam failures that hadn't been seen before. And uh, the fluid mechanics part for us is that pressures behind a dam at a point, if you integrate them over the whole dam, it becomes a force that's pushing it down and maybe distorting the, uh, the dam. And uh, if it's, the force is larger than can be sustained, in this case by the rock abutment, it wasn't the dam that failed initially, it was the rock abutment then it can't keep its impoundment. And if it can't keep its impoundment, then that goes somewhere. And things that are in the way uh, get uh, destroyed. And so the other part of it would be the part after it fails. And so you can do quite complex sim simulations based on something more complex than Bernoulli. Uh, we'll talk about conservation of uh, mass and energy in this class, which go into what are called the, the Navier-Stokes equations which allow you to simulate such things as this and overlay the flows on topography to be able to see what the effects would be, such as they would do for inundation reports for hurricanes coming on shore. So, so sobering. And so, uh, and so part of your responsibility as engineers, as you will be, is to, to make things that uh, maintain good the, luck, the public good. One man. And a bit of frivolity, of course. I'm not sure what this guy's doing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I listen to Car Talk. I don't know if you listen to Car Talk. These two brothers talking about how to repair cars. It's a phone-in show. And they're talking about some guy that got 
caught in the airspace outside LA who went up in a chair like this. I don't know whether they're joking or not. But he also carried with him a rifle so that when he wanted to come down, he could shoot the balloons to let him down slowly. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on here. So just interesting. So this is also pressure to point. Um, the reason a balloon rises is because if you think about a balloon underwater and you think about the pressure uh, change from the top to the bottom, there's an imbalance. There's more pressure acting on the bottom because it's deeper than there is on the top. If the balloon happens to be filled with water, that mass of water exactly balances the excess force pushing it up. So it's, it's neutrally buoyant. If you take the water out and replace it with air, the fact that it's less dense, which is really the marker of why a balloon rises, it means that it goes up because there's an imbalance of force. And it's uh, that which allows you to be able to say exactly what's going on. So anyway, interesting guy. I'm not sure what he's doing. Uh, and... Uh, what do I want to do? I just want to do this, I guess, right? So that's that. And of course, always dangerous to share your personal photographs with people. But living dangerously, don't do this. I'm a professional coming into work this morning. And I was searching for the guy's name last time. I told you that one of your colleagues who would have taken this class before. I, this class used to be a five credit combined fluid mechanics and thermo class. The students hated it. Um, and so it's changed from that. So Kevin would have taken the equivalent of that. Kevin uh, Witt is his name. Uh, and he's out flying today. He started a master's degree here. I don't know whether he has a day job to supplement his, uh, his hobby. But if you want to, to take a balloon ride, you can uh, go, up, uh, go up with him. So you shouldn't be taking pictures, of course, while you're driving, right? All right. What are we going to do today? I'm looking for this. Right. So I downloaded a, an upgrade, I guess, from Notability. So you can see that the controls are a little different on this. hope this is the right file to use. So we'll continue today. I mentioned last time that we'll talk about some examples. I don't know how far. You can see that we've covered a lot just from the, how far the marker on the right-hand side is going down. We avoided a lot of equations, hopefully. Uh, we talked about this last time. Um, and perhaps I'll recap this uh, before we just do some examples. Who noticed that last time we made a deliberate mistake. Anybody? Ah, oh, you didn't say? Lots of the sign convention is wrong? Yeah, okay. So if you didn't notice last time, despite what I was saying, one young lady came to talk to me at the end of class, and of course she was right. Um, and this, uh, so pressure, increase in depth, so you add from our manometer rules, go down, the pressure increases, so you add. So this should be positive. And so you might want to change that if you have that in your notes. I think we did it again here. P4 plus H2 gamma. Is this my eraser? I think that's right. Is that right? Yeah. And I think the other ones might, that, this one was okay. So I guess when you never do examples to completion, then... Uh, Sometimes it works out that way. So anyway, and this we talked about differential manometers. So let's uh, talk about what we're going to do today. Um, this is just a recap of what we've had before. Uh, the manometer rules, you know. Um, this is a useful diagram, I thought, last time to look at pressures. Whoops. Pressures worth relative to depths. This is positive Z. This is negative Z. Hence the sign convention of this with a negative sign here. And the deal was that if you look at unit weight, I'm going to black, it was exactly this, right? This is equal P equals gamma minus C multiplied by that. 
And so we said last time that the deal is if you go down, then by definition, delta Z, you add delta P. If you go up, you do the converse. So delta Z would be increasing, delta Z would be decreasing, this would be increasing, and delta P would be decreasing. If we had a different fluid in here, so if, this, if we were looking at a column where this was uh, air, then when we do the delta Z, which would be, I can't draw it very well, you get the picture. If you go down delta Z, then the change in delta P is about zero, not very big. So that explains exactly this and this for the first two. That explains this for the fifth. Um, doesn't say anything about this, but if a vapor is in if an evacuated area is in contact with this vapor, it has to be at the vapor pressure. And if you go horizontally, uh, so if we drew another, um, if we were going horizontally in a static fluid, whoops. So we had another graph like this over here. Then by definition, I wanted it to be black, but it wasn't. Then if we went horizontally, across from this elevation to this elevation, then the same fluid, it's the same as us going in a simple connected domain. There's no pressure change if you go horizontally. And that was our example of the, the hurricane, that in the low pressure region in the middle, the water should be mounded because of the lower pressure. If you go horizontally uh, at depth, at one meter depth, you get the same pressure as the outskirts of the hurricane at sea level, uh, below the rise, and therefore we tried to rationalize that a 15-foot surge could not be given just by the change in barometric pressure as you go across the hurricane. So that's that. Uh, and I guess the other thing was, yeah, so we talked about, uh, if you look at this, if you, well, probably, we'll talk about buoyancy separately, but it's useful for us to talk about it. It's certainly been the subject of midterms, of balloons going up and down. The reason we have a balloon is buoyant is that if you look at the pressure that's acting on the top, which would be this magnitude, the pressure acting on the bottom would be this magnitude, given by this uh, pressure here. And so countering those, if this was a, a balloon underwater, would be the mass of water times gravity, exactly counters it. So a balloon filled with water below the water surface would just sit there and be happy and wouldn't go anywhere. Take the water away, and it will just pop up like a cork, like a balloon, up to the surface. And because what you're doing is that the density of the balloon is reduced. It, it would be full of air. It could be a vacuum, I suppose, but it would be full of air. And so if you want to look at how a balloon behaves, it's always useful to look at the ideal gas law. As we wrote it before, we talked about absolute pressures and write it in terms of density. So these are the things that you can do to make a balloon work if you think about it rationally. You need to have the density of the balloon decreased. So you can do that by one of three things. You can reduce pressure in the balloon, but you can't really do that because a balloon is a flexible skin. So if you reduce the pressure in the balloon, it'll just collapse on itself and keep the same density of the air as it collapses. So that doesn't work. You could put in a gas that would uh, be helium, that have a different Univ uh, not universal, different gas constant, or you could increase the temperature. And of course, Kevin Witt's balloon, it increases the temperature, it's open at the bottom, it has the same pressure in the, the balloon as everywhere else because it's open at the bottom, but that's the reason that uh, you can reduce the density by keeping it warm. 
you could you, you could close the balloon and fill it with helium. So the, the example we looked at of the youngsters, young adults, launching the balloon from Golden Gate Park, uh, they had a gas cylinder, probably helium. Could use hydrogen as well. Uh, tends to be a bit explosive. Uh, if any of you know the story of the Hindenburg, the, the Zeppelins that used to routinely blow up in the 1930s. So helium is a safe, uh, lighter than air gas that uh, has a, a lower gas constant. Okay, so that's it. So that's it. So I corrected my incorrections. We've talked about those different things. So I guess um, we'll go through some examples as I promised. So today we're just going to meander through some examples. Uh, there's a yeah, there's, there's for, I don't think we'll do micromanometry. It's too um, specific. Um, well, we did mercury manometry. Oh, no, did, we did mercury as a barometer, but not manometry. Well, we'll do an example with a concrete step, and we might just talk about slightly incompressible fluids. And so we've assumed that water is incompressible. It's not completely incompressible. It's slightly incompressible. Uh, slightly compressible, right? If we said its, it's modulus is 2 gigapascals, then it's not infinity gigapascals, so it's slightly compressible. And so you could ask whether that makes an influence as you go down into the, the ocean at, at great depths. So uh, let's go through some examples. So uh, I think someone asked me, I don't know if that, I don't see him. Someone asked me, uh, what you need to do in this class to excel. And uh, I said, look at the tests. So I, uh, three of you have been to chat. Um, if you haven't downloaded the tests or ready to look at them, you should do that. I think the arbiter of how you do in this class is to be able to conceptualize questions and be able to come up in your own mind with the solution. So if I was doing preambles to tests, I would look at how I'd put the solution together, not solve it, but then look to see if that's how the solution was obtained. And so I think it's, it's much faster than going through it um, in, in great detail. So here we have an, an open tank that's uh, put in water and pulled up from water. Uh, we have a fluid, which is a gauge fluid, which is a specific gravity of 2, which means that the unit weight of the gauge fluid is equal to 2 point SG times uh, the unit weight of water. And so this, of course, in this particular case is 2.5. And so we have to solve our question of what is H in this particular case. We know the distances. Unfortunately, it's in English units. Boo-hoo, but we'll deal with it. And so we can start doing our writing. And make sure you tell me when I do something wrong. Um, we're going to start from PB. And we can go back to this point here, because I guess we also know that simply connected, by definition, the pressure here has to be the same. So we could actually cut this off and think the pressure acting upwards is, if it's a gauge pressure, the pressure PB is zero, right, by definition. PB equals atmospheric, which gauge pressure is zero, which is zero here, PB here is equal to zero as well, if we take it as gauge pressure. And so let's work from this one. So what's it uh, going to be? PB, go down, so we add. And so we go down to uh, this point here and come back up. So this is equal to adding, is that right? H minus three foot times the unit weight of the gauge fluid. That should get us to this point here. This is air. So the pressure that we get at this point here should also be the same pressure as we have at this point because of the unit weight as we go up and down in air doesn't change pressure very much. And now if we want to go down, then we add two feet times the unit weight of water. I guess I used H2O <coughs> equals PB. We know that this is equal to zero. 
We know that this is equal to zero. So we know that h minus, oh, let's write it out. So we know that h times unit weight of the gauge fluid is equal to minus 2 feet times the unit weight of H2O plus 3 feet times uh, the unit weight of the gauge fluid, which is this. And if we divide both sides through by unit weight of the gauge fluid, unit weight of the gauge fluid, uh, this becomes 1, of course, and unit weight of gauge is equal to 2.5 times the unit weight of H2O. So these become ratios, and you end up with a solution. That's it. So were my signs right? So, uh, yeah, so that's one way to do it. I guess you could work the other way, but uh, don't need to. Um, I suppose you could also ask yourself, uh, not in this question, what's the force that you have to apply to be able to lift this up? And so I guess you could work out the value, the force R, if this is uh, the area I'm not sure what this is. This, if this was the area of the tank, is it? The force R would be equal to PA times the area of the tank, if you wanted to. That's one way you could calculate what that is. So you could certainly write this equation to find out what the, um, this is, because now you know what H is. So this is 2.2 feet. And so you realize also that what's come out of this is that this is 2.2 feet. So this level of the water in here is actually down here. And so that's what you'd kind of think, right? If you think about blowing an overpressure in here, you'd blow down on this and it would push up the level of the fluid on the other side. If you suck on this, it's a net vacuum, then this would be depressed. So you know from the shape of the two meniscuses, menisci, that in this case, this is less than atmospheric pressure because it's pulling this down. If it was equal to atmospheric pressure, it would be level. If it's more than atmospheric pressure, it would be higher than this. And so you could calculate what the pressure is at A. The other way to do it would be that R is also equal to 2 feet times the unit weight of H2O times the area. So what you could do is you realize that this is equal to atmospheric. This has to be atmospheric here, so you can just cut it off like we did for the capillary tube. And so you have a free body that has the weight of this water, which you're holding up. You assume that all this other stuff has zero weight compared to that. And so this would be two feet times unit weight. That would be in kil that would be in pressure multiplied by an area. That would be a force. So two ways to get that. You pick up? Could you re-explain like setting up the initial equation? Uh, this one here? Yeah. Yeah. So all you do is you choose a place to work from, and you write the initial pressure you start off, and you add the increments of what you add to that. So here we started off by this pressure here, and I, I'll, I'll write it above. So we started off with PB. We went down to this point, um, well, I went down to this point here, and I realized that this point here has to be the same because if we're going across here, they have to be the same pressures. And so I went down to this point, and this point has to be, didn't want to draw that, this height here has to be H minus 3 feet, okay? So PB <coughs> plus H minus 3 feet. This is filled with a gauge fluid, which is mercury or something, which we call gamma G. So we find our at this point here. This is an air pocket through here. We know from what we drew earlier that if we go up or down in a gas, 
then the change in pressure is trivial, even if we go up and down a long way. And so we assume that the air pressure here, irrespective of the elevation of these two points, this surface and this surface, there's no change. So that I can migrate from this point here to this point, still the same pressure. Now I go from point A to this point. So I go down two feet. So I add two feet multiplied by the unit weight, in this case of water, which is what this fluid is. And I found myself at this place. And then the last place I go to has to be equal to PB. Okay. And then that's my equation. I know that PB is atmospheric. And so both of these are equal to zero if I'm using gauge fluid. And therefore, I know what the unit weight of the gauge fluid is. It's two times the uh, unit weight of water. I know what the unit weight of water is, and I know everything except for H. So I can solve for that. Okay. Yeah. If I wanted to, I could write it in terms of um, what's atmospheric pressure in terms of uh, English units? Is it 32 pounds per square inch? I don't know. So uh, we could write this as 101 kPa. And we could write this as 101 kPa. And then um, if we use the appropriate values of this, this would be in kilonewtons per meter cubed. This would be in kilonewtons per meter cubed. This would be in meters. Then H would come out in meters if we used uh, that. So it, it, would, it would come out to be exactly the same value. Yeah, what, what is atmospheric pressure in uh, bars? It's 32 pound, pounds per square inch, isn't it? 32 pounds per square inch? Look it up. Can someone look it up? Is it 32 PSI? Or is it 64? So, yeah, you could, it doesn't matter. You can solve it in absolute pressure or... Um, Gauge pressure. Anyway, so, micromanometer we said we won't do. Blah de blah de blah. Another manometer one. Let's just again, it's in English units, unfortunately, uh, and so we can do the same thing here. So let's try once again. What's the question? Let's decipher the question. Mercury manometer is used to measure pressure difference between two pipes. So these are pipes going into the page, pipelines, if you like. Uh, there's fuel oil in one pipeline in pipeline A and there is two different uh, densities one is 53 pounds per cubic foot one is 57 pounds per cubic foot in these different ones um, fine I won't do that air pockets become entrapped so by definition this air pocket has to be at the same elevation here. You don't know that, but I'm telling you that. Determine the pressure in pipe B if the pressure in A is 15 PSI. So this is A, so this is 15.3 PSI, which is PA. And so what do we do? Well, we want to figure out what PB is. And so you remembered when we did this previous example, we started off at one location with a pressure, and we ended up with equals to another one. So it'd be useful if it, the one that we equal is PB in the other pipeline. So let's start at location PA. And so this is the equation down here, but I'm just going to uh, write it out at the top. So in other words, we start off here with P sub A. We add to that uh, going across to here, and we go down to this point here. So this point here would be the unit weight of uh, fluid A. And we go down 3 inches plus 18 inches. So you can see before, I'm just taking my Q from below. 
It's in inches and it's in pounds per cubic feet. So you divide by 12 inches in a foot, which is this here. So that gets us to this point. We need to not stop there because we want to go across here. So we have to go down another portion here, which is going to be 6 inches. And this is in the gauge fluid, plus the unit weight of the gauge fluid times 6 over 12. Think. So we've done this bit, we've done this bit, and we've so we're here, and so we know that we can go through this manometer to get us to this new point here. I didn't want to do that, but so in other words, we can go here and come up to this point here. And now we go up six plus eighteen inches to this point here. We're going up, so if I've got my sign correction convention right. This should be 6 plus 18 inches divided by 12, multiplied by whatever this fluid is. This is fluid B, unit weight. To get to this point, uh, you don't know this, but you can ra rationalize. Well, actually, it's the same as a Tygon tube. I, I told you that if you're putting a foundation in and you want to migrate an elevation flat across your foundation, just get 30 feet of Tygon tube or a, uh, a garden hose, not uh, a non-opaque garden hose, and fill it with water. You put it at the point you want it to be over on the left-hand side. You take it 10 or 15 feet and just get the water level on the other side. That's exactly what's, what's happening here. Happens to be an air bubble, but they, uh, it's kind of inverted way of doing that. But uh, that's essentially the same deal here. And you go across here, so this is the same pressure we find ourselves here at this. And this would be uh, three inches up and five inches down. So this has to be two inches, right? Uh, and we're going down, no, yeah, we're going down, so we're adding um, two inches over 12 inches in a foot multiplied by the unit weight of B, and that's equal to PB. And so uh, if we look at what we know, I won't go, go th we know this is 15.3 pounds per, uh, PSI. Uh, we know that this is some unit weight. This is 53 p pounds per cubic foot. The gauge fluid, what is the gauge fluid, does it say? Mercury. We know that this is 13.6 times the density of water. Uh, we know the density of this. We know everything here ex except for PB. And so we solve for it. And so the rest just becomes rearranging it. Okay. This is more fun. <coughs> so uh, again, uh, trying to figure out exactly what, how pressures vary uh, within a system. And so the idea of this is, so concrete is poured into a form, as shown in figure blah, 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 to produce a set of steps. Of course, if you're pouring it into a form, it has to be open at the top. So this has to be open here to be able to pour the concrete. And uh, what's going to happen? So the question is, put a bag on here, a sack of sand from Hurricane Idalia. Your sandbag, what's the weight of the sandbag that you have to put on here that stops this from floating up? And the reason it wants to float up, if you think about it, is that you're going to fill this up to the top. And so if you look at what the pressure is going to look like, the pressure is going to look exactly like this. And so we know that as you go horizontally in a fluid, the pressure has to be the same. So if you look at the pressure here, <coughs> everywhere, perhaps I'll draw it here. I'm going to erase this one because I'm going to do something else in this point. So if you think about the change in pressure as you go down here, pressure with elevation, then underneath this step here, the pressure that's acting is going to be this P1. 
And so this pressure length here is going to be acting here and here, all the way across, exactly the same. And as we go down to this point here, this pressure that's acting here is going to be this amount here. And so a larger pressure is going to be acting on this step, on this step, and actually all the way across. Right? So it's going to be stratified. Seems strange. Seems that you'd want to be able to take the weight of stuff acting downwards. And at this point, you'd have a big three-step weight acting on you. And between um, this point and this point, you just have two steps acting on you. And you'd have one step acting on you here. But not true, right? And we know that because we know that um, dp dx equals 0. So as you go horizontally, the pressure acting vert actually in all directions at this point. It's acting this direction and this direction and this direction and this direction. But sometimes we're interested in one component because it acts on a surface that we're interested in. So that's kind of where we're going with this. Let's see if uh, my thing works out. See if it'll delete. Oh, fantastic. So um, let's I'll go back to this. So how do we do this? Well, what we can do is we can I, uh, represent this as a free body diagram. And the free body diagram, if we represent it, becomes our form, which has a weight to it. So the wooden form has a weight to it. It's open at the top. It's made of plasterboard or, or metal. So it has a weight of the form. There's weight of concrete in the form. There's the weight of the uh, bag that we're putting on it to keep it down. And there's the pressure that acts on the base. So what we could do is we could draw a free body diagram. And the free body diagram is going to be the outline that I have here. Which is this. And then we can figure out exactly what the magnitudes of these forces would be. The only difficult, well, it's not a difficult one. I guess I could redraw what I just had before. And that is if you look at the pressure distribution on the side, then it looks like this. And so the pressure at this particular point here is equal to what? It's equal to the unit weight of concrete multiplied by whatever this z is. And so if the steps are 8 inch risers, so this is 8 plus 8 plus 8, so this has to be 24 inches. So this is 24 inches. Again, another English units one. Good God. And so if you think about your free body diagram, you have a pressure PA acting all the way across here. <coughs> And you know how to calculate that. You know PB is equal to this. So B, PB times the A is equal to this. And we can just uh, use Newton's second law. And Newton's second law for us says the sum of forces in the Z direction are equal to zero or equal to mass times acceleration in the Z direction. Uh, and of course, this structure isn't accelerating, so it's equal to zero. And so that's what this expression here, well, I'm using z, but they're using y. Same, same deal. So downwards we have the weight of the bag, which we don't know. Downwards we have the weight of the concrete, which we know if we know the volume. Downwards we have the weight of the form, which we're probably given. And upwards, we have the pressure acting on this point, which is just going to be the pressure, which is the depth of the concrete, uniform acting everywhere because of this, and the area times the, um, the pressure. The area is just going to be the treads, 10 inch plus 10 inch plus 10 inch. So it's 30 inches along here, and it's 3 feet wide, 36 inches wide. 
And so th this area would be 30 by 36 inches, etc. And you can see the rest of it worked out. So the weight of concrete is the density, unit, density, the unit weight of concrete times its volume. The volume is going to be, um, how have they done this? Which is the 10 inches? The 10 inches is the width. So they've done 10 inches times 8 inches. So that would be 10 inches times 8 inches would be this. Ten inches times sixteen inches would be this. Ten inches times twenty four inches would be this. Multiplied by three feet, which is its width into the page, times its unit weight. And the weight of the form we know, and the pressure we know is the pressure multiplied by its depth. It's 20, 24 inches depth is this. This is 24 inches here. Z is equal to 24 inches. And so it's just 24 times the unit weight of concrete, and that's what this term here is. And if you uh, solve it in terms of the weight of the step, weight of the sandbag, sorry, then it comes out to be actually a big sandbag, six, 600 pounds. Um, six people, well, two, three people, right? Depends. Two, two, three 200 pound people, okay? Yeah. Our free body diagram is the, basically the form, right? The form plus the pressure acting on the bottom of the form. because it's inside the uh, free body diagram. It's the same as uh, why we would do a balloon. We did the square balloon under, underwater, right? The water balloon. And so here we would have um, the pressure acting on the top of the balloon, the pressure acting on the bottom of the balloon, which is more, because as we go down, sorry, as we go down, we have the pressure increasing. And the reason that we can sustain this, obviously, for this, the sum of forces in the z direction is off because you have a big pressure acting here and a small pressure acting here. What makes it balance is that we have the weight of this acting downwards. So that's exactly what your concrete is. In the concrete step ones, we have an open bottom. Yeah. So but is that still it's still inside there. It's still inside there. So the other way we can solve this, um, which I, I was going to solve anyway, is you can also draw your, don't know where this expression comes for, that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't know why you want to skin cats, but that's the expression. And you could draw your free body diagram, if I can see my pointer, um, like this. You could draw it as... It's a bit complicated, but you get the impression, you get the idea. And this way you'd not be using the weight of the concrete, which is a, a great segue into what I was going to do. So thanks for your question. Uh, so now uh, we still have this acting on it. So we have this acting. Let me draw, outline them. We have this acting. We still have the weight of the form acting because we've, I've drawn my blue curve to include the form. We don't have the weight of the concrete acting. We don't have the pressure of the concrete acting. But what we do have, if we draw this, is we have the pressure acting on the basis, basis of the treads. 
And so what we could do, I'm running out of colors, but is we could do this. So this pressure here, P1, we have acting here. And this pressure, P2, so P2 obviously is this magnitude here. P1, we'd have a bigger pressure acting here. And so the free body diagram for this, and it would only be acting on the treads, so it would be the weight of the sandbag plus the weight of the form plus the area of the tread multiplied by P1. Sorry. My sign convention's off, right? I'm going to change that area of the tread multiplied by P2 equals 0. And WS acting downwards, WF acting downwards, P1 times area of the tread acting upwards, and P2 times the area of the other tread acting upwards. It could be exactly the same result. So you, again, you'd solve for the weight of the, the solid, weight of the sandbag. So lots of different ways you can draw a free body diagram. And so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so I lied a little bit when I say the best way to excel at this class is get, download the tests and look at them. It's also you need to be kind of the mindset to be able to, to visualize these uh, Visualize the problem, and so do that. Yes. You could use it to be upwards or downwards, but you have to apply it consistently okay. in that particular. Yeah. Um, and manometer, and I was no, I, would, I didn't really want to do this. This last one is kind of, is interesting, uh, not particularly. Um, well, yeah, it's interesting, but not particularly. What are I talking about? Um, We've always assumed that liquids are inc incompressible so that we can use, we can throw away the changing unit weight term because it doesn't change. If you look at the surface of the ocean, the density of that water is the same as if you go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench at 10,000 meters or to see the Titanic, unfortunately. Um, but it's not true. It's going to be more dense at, the, at depth, partly because it might be more saline at depth, but also because it's got the whole weight of fluid above it, liquid above it. And this is just a very long uh, question that goes through that to figure out exactly how to do that. And it comes with the idea that if you allow it to be compressible, the pressure at how deep? I don't know. At, uh, to say how deep? I can't see. At a depth of six kilometers. Uh, the, the pressure at depth of six kilometers if it's compressible, then it means you can get more mass inside the given volume, and so you'd have more mass above you. And so not surprisingly, the pressure is larger. And if you assume it's incompressible, it's not. So it's about 2% uh, maybe difference, maybe 1%. It's uh, almost uh, 1 MPA. 1 MPA in 50 would be 2%, right? 1 MPA and 100 would be 1 percent, so it's about 1 point something percent. So trivial. We don't have to worry about it. So, anyway. so that's all she wrote uh, for this. Um, as someone pointed out last time, we won't meet on Zoom on Monday. You can enjoy yourself. There is an extra credit quiz for Monday's class that will close at midnight on Friday. And so you don't have to do it on Monday. It will probably open on Monday. I, I can't remember when it opens, but uh, it will certainly close on Friday. So for your extra 0.3% credit per additional offline, online class, you can have a go at that. And what we'll do is we will start talking about Malpasse Dam at the south of France and why it might have collapsed. And so it just becomes uh, a discussion of looking at pressures at a point 
having those pressures distributed over surfaces, as we've talked today about being underneath the tread in this form, and looking at the uh, behavior that that elicits by forcing something to fail. So have a look at Monday's class, sometimes next week. On Wednesday, I might go through that class at 30 speed, uh, so you can just see what's in it. But it might be useful to look at it before Wednesday, before we get started. Assignment 2, I guess, is live, uh, and you have all the material as of today to do that due on our schedule next um, Thursday. Of course, you'll get a nice email from me at midnight tonight. I don't send them. They're automatic emails. Are you getting emails, right, from me? Announcements each week that says what the class will be. Next week we'll be in class, not Monday, but Tuesday, but Wednesday and Friday. Have a great weekend. Don't drink too much. <laughs>